This is Queens of the Minds, the authentic stories of gold rush women who blossomed from the camouflaged, twisted roots of California. And it is recommended that you start this series from the first episode. The preceding program features stories containing sexual content, adult situations, including violence, and may be extremely disturbing to some listeners or anyone who may be secondhand listening. So, discretion is advised. The Hakka people, who mostly lived in the hills of China, found that song was a better form of communication from a distance. The high-pitched melody of Hakka hill songs helped the sound travel farther. The Hakka people used these songs as a method of courting, as expressions of love or anger, and of personal conduct. Some hill songs contained riddles, played as a competitive game where the challenger would answer the riddle also in a song with a similar melody. The Hakka Hill songs were considered the pearl of Hakka literature. A bothered young woman who was living on the outskirts of Mi Zhao, after sold to a family at 14 years old who had yet to have a son, her future mother-in-law soon gave birth to her future husband. Now, 18 years old, the woman is in agony as she attempts to sleep next to her three-year-old future husband. I will read, not sing, this Hawke Hill song. You're welcome. Do not expect it to rhyme. It's translated into English. The ballad documents the young woman's feelings on the resentment of the arrangement. In the second stanza, an elderly neighbor woman replies to the distressed girl in her own opinionated wisdom. The song's final stanza was the 18-year-old's immediate response, who was obviously even more frustrated after hearing what the old lady had to say. This Hawke Hill song will be just one more look into the possibility of the life you would have had being born a woman in China in the 19th century. Little three-year-old husband sleeping carelessly on the bed. Every night I have to serve him and he is ruining my whole life. You shall become wise, my dear girl. Your husband shall by 10 years grow and the waning moon on the early part of each month will be a full moon by the 15th and 16th days. You know, my dear aunt, when that boy grows up, I too shall grow old. The flower is blooming and the other has withered away. The full moon has risen and the sun has fallen. Queens of the Minds features the authentic stories of gold rush women who blossomed from the camouflaged, twisted roots of California. In Chapter 3, we will hear the story of the true pioneer of San Francisco's Chinatown, whose story highlights important aspects of the role the Chinese immigrants played in America's largest migration, the gold rush. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Columbia Mercantile, 1855 a reimagined Gold Rush era general store in Columbia State Historic Park, serving both local residents and state park visitors, living history and offering high quality grocery staples from local suppliers. It feels like an authentic mid 19th century mercantile. The Columbia Mercantile 1855 is a great place to discover a treasure trove of gold standard products for your modern life. Columbia Mercantile 1855 is located at 11 245 Jackson Street in the most interesting building in Columbia State Historic Park. You may know it, the red brick building with its iconic green iron doors. Open daily from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Okay, let's get to the story. In the wooden building, he had made into a bakery. Norman Ossing stood near the entrance of his establishment, 
looking out his small, single front window. Men were coming over the hill in droves. The newest ship to arrive had unloaded. With every ship, the town became more interesting, and Norman liked to keep his eyes on everything. The excitement of the arriving men's faces brought him to the memories of his own 68-day journey from Hong Kong. Finally arriving with only three other passengers and a cargo of ordered Chinese goods on the ship Swallow, he was one of the first Chinese men to arrive in San Francisco. Now, in his established bakery, he examined the scene in the square in front of him. It was absolute chaos. The saloons and restaurants were filled. Men were signing up for work, for wagons, and they were ready for a drink. As Ah Sing watched the chaos of the newcomers spread through the town, he could feel himself doing a double take. Had the day come so soon? It could not be. In the approaching crowd under a yellow silk shawl was a tall Chinese woman right there in Gumshan. And she was alone, even carrying her own trunk. A smile stretched across his face. He moved to open the door and peered out, watching her further. She was beautiful, and Norman Ah Singh decided right then he would make her his wife. The gold would not be as plentiful as they were told before crossing over, yet it was still excessive in the start of 1849, and so was the domesticated work, which the Chinese men had no problem doing. And as a whole, while gold remained rich for the taking, the Chinese were warmly welcomed. The Chinese that were in California decided to form associations for mutual protection, and shortly before Ah Toy's arrival, Ah Sing was chosen to be the high man. Ah Sing knew a beautiful Chinese wife was all that was left for him to obtain before his rise to greatness here in San Francisco. He dreamed of becoming an American millionaire. And the woman in the yellow shawl was strong, no doubt. She had survived the journey to California and he was going to need a woman like that. And surely she would also need him. He watched her enter the saloon across the street and awkwardly jumped to grab his hat and locked up his bakery mid-morning. Portsmouth Square was the first public place in Yerba Buena, originally called the Grand Plaza until Captain John B. Montgomery, the commander of the USS Portsmouth, had first raised the American flag near an adobe home there three years earlier. The first schoolhouse in California sat on the southwest corner of the block, where now also many religious services and public meetings were held. There, on the same street, Sam Brannan paraded a jar of gold on May 11th, the year before, then instigating this entire rush. Autoy sat across a small wooden table, 
from a pushy Norman Ah Saint, preparing to refuse his offer. Maybe his first mistake was introducing himself as the high man in California. Or maybe it was assuming she was a helpless woman who would be so smart to move in with the stranger for a successful start here in Gumshan. As he rambled on that surely life would be hard for a woman like her, Atoy could not hear his words. She could only think that this man was the high man she would have been sold to. She had already found her freedom, and here the high man was, trying to take it away. Atoy did not let the man finish stating his case. Instead, she stood up as he spoke pushed her chair in, and looked Ah Sing dead in the eyes and told him, You know nothing. And she left the building. Every man's eyes were on her until the door swung shut, which then they all shifted to Norman, who hung his head in embarrassment. Are you enjoying the podcast? Please, seriously, please make sure to go leave a review. Rate it or subscribe. It's so important. If you'd like to contribute and get rewarded for it, check out the Patreon program on patreon.com slash queens of the minds. You know, you can always support the podcast by supporting our sponsors. This episode is also brought to you by Colored by Kayla. Kayla specializes in lived in color, blondes, and balage. Online reviews boast Kayla is always on trend with her techniques and products and does beautiful work. Also, she's such a fun person to hang out with while sitting in her chair. And she cares about your hair, explains every step she's going to make, And most importantly, she's very talented. Kayla is located in Jamestown, and you can find her on social media by her Instagram handle and business name. At Colored by Kayla. Kayla is available 24-7 for booking appointments by calling or texting 209-288-4512. Okay, back to the story. Ah Toy hastily moved up the street and into another saloon, throwing her trunk down in disgust, and looked to a beautiful French woman who stood behind the bar. They smiled at each other, and the woman slid a glass of whiskey to Ah Toy. C'est la tournée du patron on the house. Through a mix of broken English, Cantonese, and French, the story was told and an arrangement was made. Thanks to her new friend, the barkeep's connections, Atoy was able to take over the rent in a small residence from a man who was headed to Chinese camp. The home was right off Portsmouth Square on an alley named Clay Street. After using some of the gold in her possession to pay off two months' rent, she purchased some furnishings and rugs to cover the dirt floors. At the end of the day, finally, Ah Toy shut the door to the crazy world outside that was Gumshan, and she was in her own place. Zayu. In her new home, Ah Toy looked down at her large feet with confusion. She spent her entire life never being desired, her feet had been far too big to bind. And Hakka people did not traditionally practice in the culture. And for that reason, the Hakka women usually did not move up in social rank. The golden lotus 
was hardly different than a small corseted waist for the English. It was a representation of the height of female refinement, a symbol of the elite. A Chinese woman's foot size was considered its own form of currency in China, and it was dripping with sexual overtones. The men in San Francisco, however, did not seem to mind her feet. They were no different from any that they'd ever seen. Atoy was appalled and empowered by the entranced look she received that day as she smartly navigated her new city. Upside down compared to home where Atoy had been deemed worthless. Two weeks later, at least 20 rough looking men lined Clay Street near Portsmouth Square in San Francisco. The men stood waiting to see the woman that the newspapers were calling strangely alluring. It had not been the first visit for many of the men in the crowd who were already regulars, although everyone was equally anxious. When it was finally their turn, the men in line, eight at a time, dropped an ounce of gold each worth $18 into the deep tin can for a look but do not touch. Show. The men stood at their chosen people, peering into the mysterious woman's empty room, until a few moments later, a toy would appear in a form-fitting sheer kimono. Slowly removing the robe, she would reveal her naked body, positioning herself on her bed in alluring poses exposing herself completely. The men would stamp their dusty boots and howl to the sky. The tin container rattled with every nugget dropped into it. A fee gladly paid. Unlike many of the Chinese men from her homeland that had came as indentured on ships, the exotic Atoy had no boss. All of the riches that were piling up night after night were hers and hers only. Thanks to a large bag of gold, many weeks of English lessons, and a business idea, all from the captain of the ship that she had boarded as a slave. Ah Toy, the first Chinese prostitute in San Francisco, was quickly the highest paid seductress in the new state. And Norman Ah Sing was not very happy about it. Queens of the Minds was written, produced, and narrated by me, Andrea Anderson. The theme song in San Francisco Bay is by DBUK. You can find the links to their music, tour dates, and merchandise, as well as links to all of our social media and research on the Podbean page at queensoftheminds.podbean.com. Hey, do you want to do a personal shout out for your loved one on Valentine's Day? Record a shout out using the voice recorder app in your phone and email it to southernmindqueen at gmail.com or just email what you want me to say and I'll say it for you. Shout outs are $15 via Venmo at Queens of the Minds and help support me, Andrea, in my new journey after another new chronic illness diagnosis. Come on, people, let's get a marriage proposal on air or something really good like that. Also, Sarah the Painter on Instagram has new prints of Ah Toy and Emma Nevada, among our other queens. Make sure you go check it out and get a print of your favorite queen. Now, before we go, I want to talk about something important. Did you know that four out of five of our Native women are affected by violence today? The U.S. Department of Justice found that American Indian women face murder rates that are more than 10 times the national average. Learn more at csvanw.org slash MMIW. The hashtag MMIW stands for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. The least you can do is become aware. Until recently, historians and the public have dismissed conflict history and important elements that are absolutely necessary for understanding our American history have sometimes been downplayed or virtually forgotten. 
If we do not incorporate racial and ethnic conflict in the presentation of the American experience as a whole, we will never understand how far we have come or how far we have to go. No matter how painful it is, you can only move forward by accepting the truth. Frontier pioneer Eliza Inman wrote in her journal in 1843, if hell laid to the West, Americans would cross heaven to reach it. And it looks like she was right. I'm Andrea Anderson, and thank you for taking the time to listen today. Let's meet again next time for part three of Ah Toy, the Queen of Exploitation on Queens of the Night. Hear me say, take me with you. 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 Take me with you